Hi students, welcome to the second part of the chapter 9 lecture. I apologize for getting cut off there. I wasn't paying as close attention as I should have to the timer at the bottom of my screen. Um, but as I was saying, um, with the monohybrid crosses, this is how they are set up for a, for, for a particular locus on um, a chromosome. And perhaps what I did not explain very well is what exactly do these alleles represent? Why is there one big T and one little t here, for example? Um, so at the top of the Punnett square box, you write the alleles that one parent contributes via their sperm or egg cells. So let's just say that the top here represents the male alleles and the y-axis here represents the um, females alleles. So if a male has a genotype big T little t at a certain location on his chromosome, then the only possible alleles that he can contribute to his offspring are big T and little t. Well, just by chance, half of his sperm cells are going to contain that dominant big T allele, and the other half are going to contain that little t allele. And again, the same holds true for the egg cells. Half of those egg cells are going to contain the big T or dominant allele, and half are going to contain the little t or recessive allele. So when those sperm and egg cells combine, you get the recombination here. Um, in this case, it's going to be big T, big T. In this case, it's going to be big T, little t. And in this case, it's going to be big T, little t. And then the last case here is going to be little t, little t. So what these boxes are actually representing are proportions of offspring. So you can say that 25% um, or a quarter of the offspring are going to have a homozygous dominant allele combination. 50% are going to have a heterozygous allele combination with a dominant phenotype, so that big T is going to mask the little t. And then a quarter or another 25% are going to have the little t, little t um, genotype. Wow, that is not the right... I'm not sure what just happened there. But that was... <laughs> that was interesting. That was not the way it was supposed to go. <laughs> Preview of what's to come. <laughs> what I meant to do was go to that slide. Okay. And actually, I'm going to exit so I can actually show you guys what I'm talking about here. <laughs> um, but again, this is just a Punnett square. So we have the sperm cells, for example, up top, the egg cells, for example, on the bottom. And of course, an individual egg cell is going to have alleles from every single um, loci on the chromosome. But this is just an isolated case taking the alleles from one locus. Um, and what you do for the Punnett square is just drop down um, the allele from one parent and carry across the allele from the other parent. So in this case, you end up with 25% um, of the offspring having that dominant homozygous genotype. Move on to the next box. Again, just out of convention, you always put the dominant um, allele first from that gamete, and then the lowercase allele from that gamete would go there. This will be the same as the box above it. We have big G, big G, and then again that's going to be the same as the box above it. So in this particular case we have 50% of the offspring ending up with a dominant homozygous genotype, and 50% of the offspring ending up with a heterozygous dominant genotype. So the phenotype is still going to be um, showing for the dominant trait because that little letter G is just going to be masked there. That recessive allele is going to be masked by the dominant allele. Okay, let's pick this up with the dihybrid cross. 
So far my examples have just shown you what it looks like when the parent generation differs in one um, physical characteristic, but what if two traits differ? A dihybrid cross is simply the mating of two organisms that are alike except in two characteristics. So for example, these two cats, the only things that are different about them is the fur color and the tail length. It's basically like running two monohybrid crosses simultaneously. Um, I guess what I'd like to point out here before I move on is um, you will end up in the F2 generation with unique combinations that weren't seen in the parental generation. So this brown parent cat here had a long tail, but notice some of the brown offspring have a short tail. So some of the genetics um, recombined here to show that these alleles are not necessarily linked. And this leads me to Mendel's law of independent assortment. This just states that alleles are inherited independently of each other. So this is another example of a dihybrid cross. In this case, the two um, parents differ in two physical traits. Um, seed shape is different, so round versus wrinkled, and color is different, yellow versus green. The F1 generation is allowed to um, self-pollinate, and what you end up with are many different combinations within the F2 generation. Notice that some of the offspring have the parental type genotypes, for example, all um, recessive and all dominant, but then there are others that have unique combinations. So notice that yellow color is not necessarily linked to round seed shape. You'll end up with yellow wrinkled seeds, and you'll also end up with green um, round seeds. So how can you really predict um, probabilities when you have genotype information? The rule of multiplication states that the probability of a compound event is the product of the separate probabilities of the independent events. So for example, we have the F1 genotypes. The female has big B, little b at a particular locus, and the male also has big B, little b at that same locus on the chromosome. So when meiosis occurs, half of the female's egg cells are going to carry that little b, and half are going to carry that big B. And same with the male. Half of his sperm cells are going to carry that big B allele, and half are going to carry that little b allele. So what's the probability that um, a child or an offspring produced by these two parents is going to have a big B, big B genotype for this particular locus? Well, it's just one half times one half, or one quarter. So you'll end up with one quarter of the offspring having that um, big B dominant homozygous genotype at that locus. All right, so many human traits show simple inheritance patterns like I have just talked about. So there are many, um, many diseases, for example, and syndromes that show these simple inheritance patterns where there are just um, a single locus on a chromosome um, controlling for these traits. And these are a few examples of these um, human traits and diseases. We'll get back to that in a little bit when I talk more about um, other patterns of inheritance besides simple patterns. Most human genetic disorders are recessive. In, in fact, most mammalian genetic disorders are recessive. So individuals can be carriers of these diseases. So if, if um, an individual is a carrier, that means that they have a, an allele that's recessive that could potentially cause a disease, um, but 
the only manifestation of that disease is when you're going to get a homozygous recessive condition. Um, so you have to inherit two copies of the recessive allele to actually have the disease. If you inherit one copy, you're a carrier, and if you inherit no copies, you're normal. There are also some human genetic disorders that are dominant. Achondroplasia is a form of dwarf dwarfism, and it is um, dominant. So for example here, we have a mother that's affected with achondroplasia, a father that's affected um, with achondroplasia. Half of the woman's egg cells um, are going to contain the little d, and then half will contain the um, dominant d. Half of the father's sperm cells are little d, and half are big d. So what you will end up with, just through the rules of probability, is a 1 out of 4 chance, or a 25% chance, of a child being unaffected. Um, a 2 out of 4 chance, or a 50% chance, of a child being affected with achondroplasia which means that they have um, this form of dwarfism. And then a 1 out of 4 chance, or a 25% chance, of a child being severely affected with achondroplasia. Um, and these typically do not survive pregnancy, so they do not um, make it to full term. Okay, so there are many traits that show the simple pattern of dominant versus recessive, but there are also a lot of traits that show different, um, different patterns of inheritance. So incomplete dominance is an example of one of those, and in incomplete dominance, F1 hybrids have an appearance in between the phenotypes of the two parents. So for example, you have a blending of the two colors here. The parent generation consists of one parent with red flowers and one parent with white flowers, and the F1 generation consists entirely of individuals with pink flowers. So this basically shows a blend of the two color types. And then the F2 generation, you're going to end up with 50% pink, um, 25% red and 25% white. Okay, so so far we've looked at inheritance patterns that involve only two alleles per gene. However, most genes have more than two forms, and this is known as multiple alleles. The ABO blood groups in humans are examples of multiple alleles. And it's important to keep in mind that individuals carry, at most, two alleles, but more than two alleles exist in the entire population. Um, with blood type, there are three alleles of a single gene that exist, and they are I um, superscript A, I superscript B, and lowercase i. And various combinations of the three alleles produce four different phenotypes. Letters refer to carbohydrates that may be found on the surface of red blood cells, abbreviated RBCs, red blood cells. So um, red blood cells, they may be coated with carbohydrate type A, carbohydrate type B, both A and B, or neither, in which case it would be an O blood type. The ABO blood group, um, again, it's just an example of multiple alleles here. And if you've ever had your blood type tested, it's pretty interesting. You um, add serum that contains um, carbohydrates type A and B to your blood, and you'll see what happens. Um, I'm going to go ahead and pause here and pick up in the next segment.